I want to welcome you all to this third lecture in the Principles Invitational Lecture Series uh, on Drivers of Environmental Change. We are honored to have Hans Schreier with us. Hans Schreier uh, is originally from Switzerland and uh, started off in organic chemistry in Basel, moved from there to Colorado where he worked in physical geography and uh, then he became one of the first people to get involved with remote sensing and uh, GIS uh, taking the Master of Science course in Holland which was developed uh, at that time and he completed a, a, a diploma in air photo interpretation photogrammetry and remote sensing at the International Institute of Aerial Surveys and Earth Science in Inchede in Netherlands. He then moved on to the University of Sheffield where he did a Master of Science in Geomorphology and Resource Management and finally he got his PhD here at UBC in Geomorphology in 1976. Hans has uh, amassed an extraordinary range of awards. The most interesting and unusual set of awards, uh, not the standard type of award that many academics uh, delight in, starting off with an International Development Research Center award. He was one of five Canadian researchers awarded such a, a degree or such an award during IDRC's 25th anniversary celebrations in 1996. He also had a uh, sabbatical fellowship with IDRC uh, in 1999-2000. And then he received two extraordinary recognitions. In 2004, the Science in Action Award, which is the United Nations International Year of Freshwater Science Education and Conservation Award for outstanding work in making watershed management knowledge and innovative cost-effective applications possible in Canada and in developing countries abroad. And finally, this uh, very remarkable recognition, the King Albert International Mountain Award, which is for scientific accomplishments of lasting value to the world's mountains. It's given by the King Albert Memorial Foundation in Zurich, and uh, he received that in 2008. His range of interests is, is enormous, and he will demonstrate that in, in the following lecture. But let me just, uh, before asking him to give his lecture, recap briefly what has happened in the two lectures prior to this. The first one uh, attempted to set up the program of, of lectures uh, with uh, a listing of the major drivers of environmental change and a discussion about the relative importance of relief, sea level, climate, and human activity in influencing environmental change. And one of the suggestions at that time was to say that really in the whole environmental change debate, climate, although important, has been exaggerated out of all proportion relative to the other drivers. Then in the second presentation, Professor André from Clermont-Ferrand in France uh, demonstrated from the, her experience of Arctic landscapes the way in which permafrost thaw is indeed uh, one of the dominant features of environmental change in Arctic landscapes. And she illustrated both from, from uh, northern Sweden, from Svalbard, from Russia, from northern Quebec and also from Antarctica and uh, showed us an astonishingly interesting range of illustrations. But finally, in her uh, presentation, she emphasized the uncertainties associated with many of the data that are used in the environmental change debate. And this is an important caveat uh, to all of us in declaring what is most important and what is least important uh, until we have very much better data 
uh, on which to base our generalizations. So this just to set the context for moving into the case of the mountains. And uh, Hans, we are most grateful to you for taking the time to, to do this. And uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And uh, I'm passionate about mountains, as you probably know. And for those of you who don't know mountains, this is the highest mountain of the world. And I just wanted to ask you, have you ever thought what kind of rock is on top of the highest mountain of the world? Any idea what kind of a rock is up right up here? Limestone and shale. This used to be at the ocean surface. <laughs> And it's now the highest part of the world. So what I'd like to do is give you a bit of an introduction why mountains are important. Then I'd like to look at one driver, which is climate change. Then I'd like to look at the other driver, which is land use change. Then I'll put up some challenges for you. And then I'll give you a bit of a summary. So if you look at mountains, about 25% of the world is mountains, depending on your definition. And about 22% of the people actually live in mountains, maybe permanently or temporary. So if you look at who is actually going into the mountains, some people live there, a lot of tourists go there. We have a lot of retirement people who decide to get away from the cities. And of course, we have a lot of migrants, temporary and permanent migrants. So what is unique about mountains? Well. Mountains are the water towers of humanity. They provide lots of the water which you use. Mountains are also biodiversity hotspots. Mountains are a recreational paradise, and mountains have also secret and spiritual values. However, mountains are very constrained. They're very fragile, they have hazardous conditions, and they have relatively low resilience. So if you do something nasty to them, they don't recover very fast. What happens in mountains often has a very large impact way, way downstream. And mountains have areas, are areas usually of low productivity, and in and out, getting in and out of mountains is usually quite difficult. Also, if you look at current conflicts around the world, most of them are in mountains. So these are kind of things which you should think about when you think of mountains. So let's talk a bit about water towers. What I'm showing you here is the precipitation range in the European Alps. These are the European Alps. And you can see that mountains have relatively higher rainfall than any other area. They have relatively lower evapotranspiration than the lowland. They have a seasonal accumulation of snow and ice. And uh, they're balancing summer effects in lowlands by melting what they store in the mountains. <clears throat> but mountains are extraordinarily variable. So if you look at the Himalayan range from one side to the other, and you want to look at the average precipitation, you can see that down here, people get about 11 meters. This is higher than this building, 11 meters of rain a year. If you think Vancouver is bad. And as you go along the mountain range all the way up to here, you get about 115 millimeters. That's about that much. So you have huge variability in mountains, which makes it extraordinarily difficult to actually come up with generalities. And if you look at the 24-hour intensity, you can see some of the greatest intensities in the world are actually in the Himalayas, with almost 1,000 millimeters in June. <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is the impact mountains have on the lowland. This is the Rhine River. And in, this is January all the way to December. And what, you sh what I'm showing you here is the proportion. This is the lowland, and this is the upland. And it shows you the proportion in blue, which comes from the mountains. They now suggest about 40% of the water which the people in Holland and in Germany and in France are using from that river basin actually comes from the mountains. If you go to the Alps in general, there are the water towers. If you look at the four rivers which drain the mountains, the Alpine mountains, the Rhine River, the Danube River, the Po River into Italy, and the Rhone River into France, you can see the Alpine area is relatively small. 
but the alpine discharge contribution to the lowland is actually quite large, 35%, 26%, 53%, and 41%. So we need to start paying a little more attention to mountains because as climate is becoming more variable, we're going to have some issues to deal with. So what I'm showing you here is the percent of the area of a watershed which is in the mountains in bars, and the blue part is the amount of water which is actually originating from the mountains. So if you look at these rivers, almost 100% actually of the water supply comes from those mountains. And it, this is about 55 to 80% from these mountains and so on. These are mountains from all over the world. And you can see water is going to be next to energy, the biggest issue we're going to have to face in the future. Mountains are also hotspots of biodiversity because you've got all kinds of ecosystems going up in very tight formations. So we have a whole spectrum of different animals. And we also have a whole spectrum of different plants. And so this is really the source of many, many interesting uh, biodiversity studies. Mountains are also the paradise for recreation. And I just put up here a little bit of the history of recreation. It is really interesting. About 19, 1850, the very first recreation was actually a sanatorium. All the people during the Industrial Revolution who got tuberculosis, the only cure they had was to go up to the mountains where it was cold, where the bacteria couldn't do that much. And that's when they developed spas. Then we had the mountain climbers coming around 1900. Then the skiing started, then golfing and hiking, mountain biking. And guess what? What is the newest attra attraction in the mountains? Wellness centers and spas. So we're going back to history and redo this whole thing. And of course, pilgrims have always gone to the mountains. If many of you are from the Himalayas, you know there are many sacred areas and people go up there in droves. <clears throat> all kinds of celebration in mountains. But mountains are extremely hazardous. We have all kinds of hazards in terms of avalanches. We have all kinds of hazards in, in uh, large rainfall events, which create all kinds of landslides. And then you can see what happens downstream. <clears throat> Here is a good example of a very massive rainfall event, which creates massive amounts of erosion. And you can see the effect is really not in the mountains alone. It's way, way downstream. <clears throat> Closer to home, we get sometimes a very interesting rainfall event. This is what happens in the mountain part, and this is what happens down in the lowland. So there is a teleconnection between the mountains, not just for the water alone, but also for the hazards. So that gets me now to the drivers of environmental change. There are basically two drivers, land use change and climate change. And I would argue that probably land use change is probably more important than climate change. But unfortunately, we can't unravel these, th these things very easily because climate is changing and land use is changing at the same time. And we can't start an experiment where we hold the land use constant and have the climate change or have the climate constant and have the land use change. So, we're speculating what is more important, but what is much more important than that is how do they interact? So if you look at rain, when the rain hits the surface, it has four ways to go. It can evaporate, it can run over the surface, it can go into the soil, and it can go into the groundwater. So if you're in a forest environment, this is how the rainfall is partitioned. If you then change the land use from forestry to agriculture to urbanization, you can see how we're changing the hydrological cycle. So if we're in a complete urban environment, you get mostly impervious surfaces, the river, the water runs off and creates all kinds of flooding. So land use is going to be very critical for water and whatever water does. So let's see what we know about climate change in the mountains. We know that everybody is telling us it's getting warmer. And yesterday I found out now the, the latest forecast is that it might even get up to four degree increases in the next 50 years rather than the two degree increases. But these are averages. And I don't believe in averages because 
To me, an average is your head is in the oven, your feet are in the fridge, and your belly button is average. <coughs> so this is what the climate models are telling us. They're telling us temperatures are getting warmer. We have very uncertain precipitation. We're going to have earlier snow melt in the northern hemisphere. We're going to have ac accelerated glacial melt. We're going to have some rain in, on snow events, which means the river pattern is going to change. And that means we have to deal with a lot of greater variability and uncertainty. My colleague at the University of Washington in uh, Seattle, uh, Alan Hamlet, has just done a, a very interesting study where he looked at all the global models and he compared them for the Columbia Basin. And these are the kind of projections all these different models are doing. It's the American model, the Australian model, the British model, and they all show that things are going in the same direction. You might argue, well, the difference is a little bit large in 2100, but right now the predictions are fairly close. However, when you do the same thing for precipitation in the mountains, you get this picture. <laughs> this is a bit of a disaster because some models tell us it's getting less rain and some models telling us massively more rain. How are we gonna say or predict or do anything with this kind of a data. This is uncertainty, and that's what we're going to have to live with. And in the mountains, the uncertainty is even greater than in all the lowland. What is even more important is what is happening in terms of temperatures in the mountains. What I'm showing you here is a profile from the Arctic to the Antarctic. And this is the elevation range of the mountains from north to south. And the dark colors are the greatest increases in temperature. So when you look at this at, in the high mountains here in the northern hemisphere, temperatures are actually warming up faster than in these lowlands. However, the closer to home, the mountains in this part of Western North America, they're actually showing a very dramatic picture. This is December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, and so on. And this is elevation. And what these data are now showing us is that the temperatures in the high mountains are actually warming up faster than in the low part of the, uh, of the environment. And this is bad news because we have all the glaciers in the mountains. They are the storage, the water storage. We have all the snow in the mountains that stores the water temporarily. And March, April, May is warming up faster. That means the snow is going to melt a bit faster and the glaciers are going to melt faster. Do we have enough data to actually show this? What I'm showing you here is the snow accumulation 1st of April from 1950 to 1997. And the red circles means we have had a massive decrease and the blue circles said we had an increase in April. <laughs> and the bigger the circle, the greater the decrease or the increase. And this is the model data. So you can see we have clear evidence that we have less snow 1st of April. We also have significant evidence that because the snow is melting earlier, the peak flow of the stream is going to be earlier, and in late summer we will have less water in the streams. So if you look at this, this is in March, this is the discharge of the rivers, and you can see most of them are actually increasing. And this is the discharge of many of these rivers in uh, June, and actually they're decreasing. So what the models are telling us, we can actually already see in the data which we have. If you don't believe me, uh, there's a very nice uh, study going on in Glacier National Park in Montana. My uh, good colleague <coughs> um, has been taking lots of pictures. The park was created in the early 1900s, and because it was an icon in the US, a lot of people took lots of pictures. And uh, <coughs> My colleague has been doing a lot of uh, redoing the same pictures. And so you can see this is what it was in, 19, in 1919. This is what it is now. And if you look at another glacier, you get a very similar picture. Dan Fargray has a whole library of these pictures. And he's telling us now that when they started the park, they had 128 glaciers. Now they have about 25. And he said by 2040, they probably will, will have none. And he's already proposing that they change the name of the park because there won't be any glaciers left. 
Similarly, what happened in the European Ops is quite interesting. In 2003, they had this very, very hot summer and glaciers were melting very rapidly. In fact, the hydropower station in Switzerland could hardly cope with the amount of water which was melting. And France, which is 70% nuclear, had to shut down nuclear plants because in the non-glaciated rivers, they had not enough water to cool the, company, uh, the, uh, the plant. Also with climate change, we have these really dramatic events which happen quite frequently in the Himalayas now. We call them glacial lake outspurt flood. You can see an early picture here. The glacier was down here. It started melting and then the, perma and the, gl and the side glacier melted faster. So you have some water, a lake deformed. And then the permafrost melted and all of a sudden you get a dam burst. And when that happens, some real dramatic things happen. I'll show you the pictures during one of these events. You can see how it's going and you see what happens downstream. And what is really even more important is this is what the valley looked like before the glacial lake outburst flood and this is the valley after. And look at the sediment which is now in this river and this will be the source of Mike Church's study for the next 200 years because this stuff is not going to move very fast and it will be a continuous problem downstream. This is one of the glaciers I was up two years ago in the tropics in Colombia. They have four glaciers left and I suspect they won't last for more than about 10 years. And these are the water supplies for many, many people. So this is giving you a bit of an idea of what the uh, situation is in terms of climate change. But now let's look at land use. And what I'd like to focus on is the pressure for hydropower production. Everybody now is talking about green energy. If you would have proposed to build a big reservoir five or 10 years ago, everybody would, would have told you you're out of your mind because we have had some very bad experiences with hydropower projects. However, I am almost certain we will have to reconsider that idea very quickly. So we have to look at hydropower, we have to look at agricultural intensification, and I'll tell you later on why. We have to look at more tourism, and we have to look at how we manage our forests. This is the history of hydropower dam construction in the world. You can see the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we built hydropower stations all over the world. And then it got in disrepute and all the easy sites were already built up and it declined almost to very small things except in China. <clears throat> this is the history of hydropower development. We have learned a, a real deal that whenever you build a reservoir, you change the hydrology, you change the water quality, you change the fluvial geomorphology, you have all kinds of impacts on aquatic systems and on human, and of course it also affects the local climate. And these are all the different kind of things which hydropower projects do to the natural regime. Fairly complex. Have you ever seen a sign like this? This is the newest traffic sign I'm trying to show you. You know what it says? It says, if the water rises, run away. You are warned not to stay in the riverbed. The hydroelectric plant may cause a sudden flood anytime, even in good weather. They have had several incidents where tourists were sitting in the riverbed picnicking, and all of a sudden this flush of water came and inundated, and some of them were killed. Now, why would that happen? Switzerland has seven hydropower companies who do nothing else than deliver peak power. You know that between seven and nine and between five and nine, all of a sudden everybody wants power. And if there's a football game or a hockey game on, everybody goes to the fridge at, at break periods. So there's a huge surge. Now, if you're all nuclear, a nuclear power plant can only produce water constant, the constant supply. 
But if you need peak power, what do you do? So these companies, all they do is they produce peak power, they release water when it's needed, and when they don't need power in the late evening or from 2 to 6 o'clock, they pump the water back up into the reservoir. And they can make a lot of money with this. And just to show you what this means to the river system, here is a, a situation in 1974, 1991, and 2001. The blue is 74, the green is 91, and the red is 2001. The same time period in January. And you can see how the peak power, the power in general has increased, but the peak power has increased. And that makes it extraordinarily difficult. So peaking is a real big deal. This is a map of Switzerland with all the river basins. And the ones in blue are the only rivers which are still flowing under natural conditions. The one in red are influenced by hydropower stations and the one in orange are the ones which are peaking. That means whenever high demand is, they release a huge amount of water and you get this fluctuation. So you get a very artificial way of changing the river system. This is just showing you the variability in hydropower demand. This everything is a day and you can see these peaks. And this is going to be the big challenge because uh, if we go into wind power, which is very uncertain, we still need something which is very steady and hydropower is going to do that. This is just an idea of what we do locally. This is the Columbia Basin. There are 400 different storage reservoirs in that basin and something like almost 40 hydropower stations in it. It's the most dammed dam watershed in the world. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> just to give you an idea how this changes the entire regulation of the water, not only for agricultural use, but also for the aquatic biota for fish and for sediment transport. <coughs> This is just showing you all the hydropower stations in Switzerland in red. You can see we have massive amounts of uh, storage and withdrawals. There are all kinds of problems associated with this. This is in the Columbia Basin and everybody said, well, once we built these wonderful lakes, this is a fabulous recreational opportunity. Well, that depends on your hydropower station and your reservoir. This is what uh, one of the reservoirs looks like in the middle of the summer because it's a relatively shallow reservoir and when they draw all the water, it's great uh, recreational opportunities. <clears throat> so when we built these stations in these high mountains and we have to deal with this real uncertain precipitation, I want to show you one incident I was exposed to. <clears throat> They built this dam in Nepal. It's one of the biggest hydropower dams in the country. And in 1993, about 10 years after they built the dam, we had this incredible rainfall event where we got 450 millimeters in 24 hours. Vancouver gets about 1,500 millimeters a year. We got 550 in one day. And when th these kind of events happen, there is virtually nothing you can do. You can see what happens at the top of the mountains and you can see what, what the kind of material which was moved. What was particularly interesting because everybody tells you if you have a nice forest in the headwaters that protects you from all the problems. Well that's true for most of the normal events but when you get these big events there's absolutely nothing you can do. So what happens when you get an event like this? You get massive amounts of sediments and you can see the red line is how much sediment accumulated in this event in the reservoir. In this one storm, they lost a third of the reservoir capacity. So if you then look at the sediments in 1963, when they built, or the, the, since they built the station until about uh, the storm, there was a, a relatively low level of sediment transport. And then we had this massive storm with lots of uncertainty in the data. <laughs> and now, of course, in 94, you had significantly less. But it's going to take a very, very long time before we, back, we are back to this normal condition because you now have all this sediment stored within the system, which can actually be transported 
during the next few events. So that's a bit on hydropower. Now let's look at some of the other land use issues. Uh, in many mountain areas, we have a fairly rapid population growth. If you're in a subsistence environment, you're going to do some very intensive agriculture. That's often not enough. And you might go on to some real marginal land to still produce food, which means you're going to go to the forest to collect whatever you can collect to support agriculture. That's not only the firewood, but also the litter, the leaves, whatever you can use. And in the Himalayas, many people cut the branches of trees on a regular basis and feed that to the animal as a supplementary food. And this is now at the point now where in Nepal you get this monsoon season where you get most of your rainfall in four months between June and September. And the rest of the year it's very dry. So if you then have this dry period and you do this intensive agricultural use, we're running out of water in the, some, in the dry season. The rivers virtually have no more water. <clears throat> so doing agriculture in the mountain environment has all kinds of issues. It's a difficult terrain. The dist it has a distinct dry season. It has harsh climatic conditions, limited production potential, steep slopes, li limited soil development, and so on. So your production is actually limited. So what you can do is you can terrace, which is extraordinarily labor intensive. You can store water and conserve it as much as you can. You can look at tolerant crops. You can pro you co come up with better processing because bringing food in is very difficult. You have to look at more adaptive species and so on. So if you go on marginal land, the problem is it's hazardous. You're going to cultivate a few years, and then, of course, something like this happens. And so the risk of expanding into marginal land and converting forest into agriculture is not a very good idea, because sooner or later you're going to have slope failures, sedimentation, and you, with the sedimentation you're actually losing nutrients. And typically we say the erosion rate in these areas are at least 10 to 15 tons per hectare. If you go to very intensive operations, you can actually produce quite a lot. However, this is incredibly labor intensive. This is the only place I ever worked where they grow four crops per year. And that's only possible because they have now these short growing varieties, like the short rice growing varieties, which you can grow in 80 days. So they can actually go grow crop by crop by crop over the year cycle. If you do that, you're really challenged. And I'll show you, this is the dry season, this is the wet season. And right now, they're able to get water to every one of these terraces. There are 13,000 terraces. And they can get water to these terraces in two weeks once the monsoon starts. An incredible system. However, if the monsoon doesn't come, which we now have evidence that in the past that has actually happened, this system is going to fall apart. What is also important when you go to this kind of intensification, you can no longer actually maintain your nutrient supply. What I'm showing you here is each bar is an individual farmer. And th th they are all growing corn. And we calculated whether they have a deficit or a surplus. We calculate how much nutrients, nitrogen is being needed for the crop. How much are they applying? Is it in balance? Is it a surplus or a deficit? Well, you can see all of these are in deficit and all of these are a little bit in surplus. If you go to rice, you can see about half are doing not too badly and half are doing quite well because what happens in rice fields, you accumulate nutrients from above. And I'll show you that in a bit. If you then look at the very, very intensive things in 2000, this was the nitrogen balance for uh, irrigate, irrigated systems. And this is six years before. So you can see over this time period, things have actually gotten worse over a six year period in terms of nitrogen. What is also particularly interesting is 
in the developing countries, most of the food is actually being grown with fertilizer, which is donated from food aid. And most of the fertilizers is nitrogen and phosphorus. However, we need three macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It's good for Canada with all the potash issues. However, we, ever, we always thought potash is not an issue in the Himalayas because the bedrock in the Himalayas is full of mica. And so potash is being, uh, potassium is being released on a continuous basis. So we never worried about it until we saw this. This was in 1994 and this is in 2000. And you can see with this intensive agriculture where you grow crop upon crop and you don't put enough in, all of this is negative. And so very intensive agriculture is a huge driver of environmental change in the chemistry, and it's also a huge demand for water. And the, the funny thing is, if you live in the lower part of the watershed and you have a rice field like this, you're actually benefiting from the erosion which is taking place from the poor farmers or further up. So what I'm showing you here is the 45 degree line, which means this is the nutrient content for calcium in this case uh, in the sediment. And that's the nutrient content in the soil after the crop was grown and after the new sediment was put on top of it. So if you look at this, all these rice fields are actually benefiting from the upstream erosion in terms of phosphorus, in terms of calcium, and in terms of carbon. So you could say, well, that's an enrichment. At least there's some good news in the bad news because the bad news is that poor farmers on top are losing and the, uh, and the, large, uh, the rich farmers in the lowland are actually winning. <clears throat> so I told you that for, uh, for, uh, mountains are erodible and they're not very resilient in recovery. So we have a lot of these red soils in the Himalayas and these red soils are the oldest soils on the landscape. The reason why they are red is because they have been leached and all the real soluble material has been leached out and what remains is aluminum and iron, that's why they're red. And so when you look at these soils, they're extremely difficult to actually cultivate because they have a lot of aluminum which is toxic to plants. And so if you don't behave properly with these soils, they're, they pay back badly to you. Just want to show you if you look at the irrigated fields, the rain-fed fields, the grazing land and the forest, this is the acidity of these soils. And these are the red soils and these are the non-red soils. And you can see the grazing lands and the forest are extraordinarily acidic. And as soon as they're acidic, phosphorus, which is a real important fertilizer, is no longer available because the phosphorus reacts immediately with iron and aluminum. And if you look at this, you can see all the red soils have very, very little available phosphorus as opposed to the non-red soils. The reason why I'm telling you this is the following. If you look at the acidity from very acid to alkaline, if you have a, if you have a pH of four, you have a lot of aluminum which sucks up all the phosphorus. If you go to about five, you have a lot of iron which sucks up all the phosphorus. And only at this point here, about 6.5 pH, have you actually possibilities to use the phosphorus which you apply. And this is the solubility of aluminum, very insoluble, but as soon as you go below that pH. And I've just shown you the pH of these red soils is around four. So whatever you do, you're going to create some additional problems. So we actually looked at how much phosphorus which you apply is sorbed by these red soils. And these are the red soils, and these are the non-red soils. And then we produced a map. And the map actually shows you where you should not apply fertilizer, phosphorus fertilizer, because if you do, you're wasting your money because it immediately becomes unavailable. So if you do that, you can see you get some massive erosions in these soils if you don't to uh, manage the areas well, quite well. We did a bit of an experiment where we applied some lime to neutralize this acidity. 
lime once, lime twice, put manure on manure. And I don't need to show you the data, I need to show you the picture. You can see the most successful thing was by simply changing the pH. However, we have lots of these areas. And they have been degraded because of overuse. And now they're in a very bad state of affairs. And now, how would you rehabilitate these areas? This is a formidable challenge because if we just leave them as they are, they produce massive amounts of sediments. And the people downstream who irrigate, they have to dig out all the sediments out of the irrigation channel on a continuous basis. So what we tried to do is we tried to put up a demonstration site and said, we're going to plant trees here. And we're going to only plant nitrogen-fixing trees which can take the nitrogen from the air and convert it into available nitrogen for plants to grow. And we also wanted to have trees which are possible to convert phosphorus from the soil, which is not available, into available form. And some trees can actually do this with a fungus, a mycorrhizal fungi, which can convert solid unavailable phosphorus into available phosphorus. So we, we looked around and there are 28 tree species in Nepal which are nitrogen fixers and the animals can eat the leaves and about 10% of them are also mycorrhizal. We planted them out in hedgerows which you can cut twice a year and you incorporate it into the soil and the second time you give it to the animals for feed. And over time, from 94 to 95 to 97 to 2001, we have actually created a biodiversity hotspot. We have now something like 40 different species in there. We have rehabilitated the whole site. But I want you to be aware, this took eight years and massive amounts of effort. So if we don't do very careful thinking when we utilize these soils, the rehabilitation part is going to be quite a nightmare. That gets me now to the urban and the tourist drivers of environmental change in mountains. In, in Latin America, in the Andes, we have lots of big cities high in the mountains. La Paz, Quito, Bogota, Cali. All of these cities, they're very, very large. They rely on the mountains for their water supply. And of course, in the European Alps, the pressure is not so much in cities, but it's all the tourism. So if you go and, a, and urbanize the mountain environment, in this case, this is a local example. This was all forest in 1984. This was urbanized in 11 years. You can see how we change the land surface. We make it from a pervious surface to an impervious surface. And when you do that, you change the hydrology of your river system. A normal river in a forest usually responds like this in discharge after the rainfall. And if you make it impervious, you get this response, which means you get a much faster flood <coughs> after the rain stops or after the peak of the rain. You get a a much higher peak flow, more flooding, and usually you get much less base flow. And the other thing we found now is if you want to have a lot of biodiversity in your stream and you look at invertebrates as an index, if your watershed is highly impervious, and this is the degree of biodiversity in your aquatic system, you can see this nice curvilinear relationship, and it doesn't matter whether you look at invertebrates or whether you look at species diversity or insect diversity, all of them give you this relationship, which means at about 10, 15% of imperviousness, you're losing the biodiversity. So if we start building more cities in the mountains, we're going to not only have water changes in the flow, but we also will have changes in the biodiversity of the river. These are some figures on mountain recreation. By 2020, we expect about 1.56 billion people to go to these recreational areas. And the money made is estimated by $2 trillion. These are all estimates. You don't need to believe it. But it gives you a bit of an idea of the pressure which is on mountains for recreation. 
just to give you an idea what happened in the Okanagan, it's a semi-mountain environment, in 71 to 2010, we had a 175% increase in population. We had a 600% increase in golf courses. We had a 100% increase in ski hills. And we had 81% increase in water storage. And you have to ask yourself, well, how much more water can you actually get out of that system? <clears throat> the problem we have with winter recreation is Typically, rivers discharge looks something like this. This is January to December, and so in, in uh, November, December, January, February, March, we usually have the lowest flow in the river. And when do people go skiing? In December, January, February, at the time when there is the least amount of water in the system. Just to show you what the infrastructure looks like in some of these mountains, this gives you an idea of all the infrastructure they have built to support this kind of tourism. And just to give you an example from Germany here, they have in one resort area 28 cable cars with a capacity of 16,000 people per hour. This is like urban tra rapid transit. It's actually better than urban rapid transit because you don't get stuck in, uh, in uh, traffic jams. They have 75 kilometers of ski runs and 110 kilometers of cross-country runs. So we're talking of massive land use changes in these environments. That gets me to this. For those of you who don't know what this means, it's an advertisement and it says, snow security for sure. People are now advertising that their ski hill will be secure. Because if you cannot open at Christmas economically, you can't make it. And they say you need about 100 days of good ski, uh, good snow in order to be economically viable. So snow security for sure is now the advertisement. And you can see these wonderful machines all over the place. And if you now look at what is happening, it's actually quite interesting. These are the total numbers of um, ski resorts in uh, Europe, in the European Alps, about 620 or something. And with snowmaking, they can probably survive if they are at low elevation for some time, but over time they won't. And they're now saying if the temperatures will increase by two degrees, we will have that many ski resorts economically viable. And if it's four degrees, we will go down to here. That means overall in Europe, they predict about a 70% loss in ski operations if the temperatures are going to go up. And these are the different countries. The, this is Switzerland in red, um, Italy in green, and Germany in blue. They're saying Germany in the next 20 years probably won't be able to have active snowmaking possibilities, and they probably won't be able to have 100 days of snow. So what I did is I kind of looked at Switzerland and the Alpine region and said, at what elevation are you? They're now saying with every degree increase in temperature, you have to move up 150 meters in elevation. And if you do that, right now, there are 230 at above, uh, this is what's there now. And these are the ones which are above 1,200. These are about 1,500 meters. These are about 1,800 meters. And these are above 2,000 meters. And you can see with these, with these kind of scenarios, you get the picture. You're not going to be able to make snow, and it's not going to be very viable. So how much water does it actually take to make snow? Remember, this is the driest part of the year. So I actually calculated how much snow it takes. And it takes about 2,000 cubic meters for one hectare of snow with 30 centimeter depth. And if you do that, you compare that to other uses. So snowmaking is about 2,000 cubic meters per hectare. Um, cereal production is about 3,500. So this is like a low agricultural crop. Grape production about 3,800. And look at golf courses. Golf courses take about almost 10,000 cubic meters per hectare per year. 
So all of these recreational activities are going to require huge amounts of water. So how do we adapt? They put a plastic sheet over a remaining glacier in Switzerland, hoping that they can stall the melting a little faster. And then they built these little reservoirs to collect whatever they can collect so that they actually have enough water to make snow. So this is, of course, a very stupid adaptation technique and will all help you for a few years and then you're in trouble. <clears throat> the infrastructure is massive, as you can see. The other thing which has happened, and is particularly the case in the European Alps, where they have channelized most of the rivers. Because we have always said, if you really want to protect yourself from flooding, channelize the stuff and get it out as fast as possible. And now they're realizing that's a big mistake. Because if you have a natural river, the water can actually go sideways. It doesn't have to go straight down. So in Switzerland, they're now in this big dilemma. They've channelized everything, and now they want to build a natural river system again. But the land is so expensive that nobody can afford to buy the land around the river. And then wherever they can, they do something like this. They enlarged it, trying to recreate a natural system. That's not going to help you very much. You need many of these in order to do it. So the message here is, don't do, learn from the mistakes, never do this in a mountain environment. Let the natural river go and help it along. <clears throat> An example of this channelization is here. Um, in 2003, we had an excursion up here, and I want you to pay attention to this part and that part and compare that to this and that part. They had one of these real interesting rain events, and guess what happened? The whole river was channelized, and you can see the damage. And if you have headwaters like this, which are extraordinarily erodible to start with, there's really not much you can do. You should, in fact, never build a city on a fan where the river comes down. This is the fan area, and you know the natural river will move all over this fan at different times of the year. So this is obviously not a very clever idea. So what do we do in the forest? Well, in the forest, we do all kinds of interesting things, particularly in the third world. We, uh, we use fodder, we use litter, we use fuel wood, we make pulp and paper, we use timber, we use medicine plant, biodiversity protection, aesthetic and recreational things, and wildlife. All of this puts huge pressure on forests. And what we typically say when you do all these things like harvesting, afforestation, road construction, long-term management, these are the kind of impacts you have on the water supply. Typically, this is the way we do logging. And we build lots of roads in the mountains in order to get to the timber. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at it, about 30% of the global forest is actually in the mountains. And as the forest supply is getting shorter, we're going to move up into the mountains. So we're going to lose the forestry hotspots, but we're also creating some difficult conditions for hydrology. Just to give you a bit of an idea, we have about 200 thousand kilometers of paved roads in British Columbia alone. But we have somewhere between 450,000 and 500,000 logging roads. And we don't build the logging roads the way we do the freeways, because we build them fast, and then we usually don't maintain them. And then they're the, the big source of sediment. They're also the big source of all kinds of hydrological changes. And the reason why we're particularly interested in sediments is we now know that all the pathogens for your drinking water are usually associated with the sediments. There's a colleague of mine, Les Lafkovic, had a st student studying this. He looked at the different organisms which form in the clear water, the different organisms which form in the suspended sediment, and the different organisms which are in the bed, bed sediment. And if you look at these numbers, they're very relatively little organisms in the clear water. There's quite a large number in the bed sediments, but an order or two magnitudes higher in the suspended sediment, because these pathogens can actually hide in the clays in the spaces. And then even if we chlorinate, they're quite happy because they're nicely protected via biofilm. 
So if we can avoid the sediments, we can avoid a lot of problems for health in drinking water. We're going to have to deal with more forest fires. What I'm showing you here is the number of hectares in blue which has have been affected by fire every year in BC and the red is the total number of fires and you could say well there's really no difference in the number of fires it's highly variable but you can see since about 2002 the area which has been burned has increased quite dramatically and again forest fires create all kinds of problems for the water supply if you have a very hot fire, you create hydrophobicity, which means the water can no longer infiltrate, it will run off. Pine beetles, you know all about it. As temperatures get higher, trees are more stressed, you're going to get more disease, and then you've got a new problem to deal with. So if you change your forest system in the high mountain, which is usually quite a protective mechanism, then you have all kinds of impacts on the hydrology and you've got all kinds of impacts on the water quality. We say wetlands are the very best storage systems for water and the best filtering systems. And this is just an idea of how much we don't like wetlands. Wetlands are nasty because we can't go through them, we get lost. People have been written hist historic books about people disappearing in wetlands and so on, so we, we hate them but they're probably the best ecosystem we have. And look at Switzerland, in 1850, they had about 14,000 hectares of wetlands, and today they have 9% of that left. And we're now creating wetlands because we think that might be an alternative to uh, hydropower, uh, hydro reservoir. Mining is another issue in the, in the mountains, particularly where the mining is using metals which are in the sulfate form because as soon as you expose them, they oxidize and they create acid conditions and then all these metals get mobilized. <clears throat> and then we get, of course, into the problem of infrastructure because these environments are very hazardous. You can see the kind of problems we have when we have these hazardous events and uh, don't need to show you that. So, a bit of a challenge for you. What is the anticipated environmental changes which are going to happen in the mountains? I put this up as a kind of an interesting idea. We have three different types of watersheds. We have watersheds which are rain dominated. We have watersheds which are snow dominated. And we have watersheds which are glacial dominated. Each one gives you a very different flow pattern. The blue one is now and the red one is somewhere in the future. So we could say, with climate increase and greater variability, there might be some changes, but probably not that many changes depending on where you are in a, in a rain-fed environment. Unless you're maybe here on the coast or some other places, if you have a real climate shift, it could change much more dramatically. But what is much more important for us is the snow-dominated ones because what the blue one is now and the, the red one is in the future. And what I'm suggesting here is we're going to have a much earlier peak flow and a much higher peak flow. And then we might have less water in the summer. And this is more dramatic in glacial dominated things, which you can see you get the same thing, but then you don't have this late summer peak from the glacial melt. <coughs> so, if we look at floods and storms, we have this graph where we have the 100 and 200 year return period. This is usually what the data tells us. And if climate variability is actually increasing, we're going to expect something like this, which means we're going to get these 100 year storms on a much more frequent basis. And we're totally unprepared for that. So we'll have a shift. In the ecosystem to higher elevation, we're going to have a shift in biodiversity. We're going to have a lot of invasive species. We're going to have more disease and we're going to have more fires. All the global models are predicting that. That means we'll have low land impacts. We're going to have more floods. We're going to have more droughts and we have more sediments. The hazards are also increasing because the permafrost is melting. And we now have quite a lot of evidence of very unusual events. 
If you look at Moscow last summer, they had the highest July temperature ever recorded, and it's way over the probability that anybody has ever measured. So we're expecting increased climatic variability. We, we should not channelize as a result of it. We should not soil compact, uh, compact the soils. We should be much more interested in not building flood protection structures, but starting to de designate areas where we can actually store flood water. So here's an experiment. I don't know whether this works, but then I said, well, if climate change and land use change are operating at the same time, there must be cumulative effects. So if we have increased storm events and increased rainfall events, and you've got soil compaction and impervious surfaces, you should definitely have an increase in flooding and an increase in peak flow. If we have increased temperature and early snow melt, and we have conversion of forests into grassland, that means the snow accumulation is going to be less in the grassland, it's going to melt earlier, so we're going to have a more a dramatic change in the runoff. If we have higher temperatures, and we have increased demand for agriculture, urbanization, and recreation, we're going to have more droughts. We're going to have more challenges for the environmental services. Until now, we have allocated water for human beings. And for the first time, we're talking about how much should we allocate for environmental services. If you have higher temperatures and you have more monocultures, you're going to have more disease and more fires. If you have higher temperature and glacial melt, you increase the water demand for tourism and you're going to have droughts and environmental problems. Increased melting of permafrost, more land disturbance by tourism, the combination of it is obviously more hazardous. So in summary, we have hydrological and biodiversity challenges. And what we actually can do as a kind of an adaptation method, we can recreate natural channels and build massive buffer zones around these channels and create wetlands within that buffer zone. This is one hedge against some of these events which are coming. We also should designate floodwater storage areas, not building more protective structures and everybody builds behind them thinking they're safe. We have to start moving ski areas to higher elevation where they can or abandon ones which are at low elevation. When building new reservoirs, we need to learn from all the mistakes we made in the past. And improved soil management is absolutely critical because soils can hold massive amounts of water. In terms of biodiversity, we need to protect areas like the biosphere reserve. We need to replant forests with a much wider range of trees because right now in BC, we plant three species. And the growing rate is about 80 years, and probably most of them are the wrong species. So let's put a whole variety of species out so that we have a hedge against what works and what doesn't work.